Hey, good morning, Connect Church, and good morning to all of our visitors. Thank you for joining us for worship. And uh, let's just get into it. You have 
pass my by to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that curse. Glad to see you. My name is Ginger and I'm coming to you from Mesa, Arizona. It's going to be another hot day and uh, it's a nice long weekend and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Memorial Day before we get kind of started with the rest of the announcements. One of the things that I learned is that you're not supposed to say Happy Memorial Day. You know it's not Christmas and it's not your birthday but it's a day that we stop and remember those who have uh, fallen and given their lives uh, for our country. You know, Memorial Day uh, began in 1868, 
um, right after the Civil War and it became an official national holiday in 1967, about a hundred years later. Uh, so when you're out there looking for those great sales, maybe having a barbecue, you know, give a toast to uh, one of the full fallen soldiers. And, you know, do you know someone that has uh, given their life as a military um, service, you know, maybe a, a, a friend of yours or someone you know, a relative, you know, put their name down in the comment section and uh, we'll show some honor to them this weekend. Now, uh, one of the things that we have coming up is our uh, prayer and worship time this coming Wednesday at 6.30. It's going to be a great time. We're having some special guests coming from uh, California that are going to be leading us in worship, and you're not going to want to miss it. So we'll see you here uh, Wednesday night at 6.30. Davey? Hey, thanks, Ginger, and thank you to everyone who has served or is serving our country right now. Huge shout out for you. High honor to all of you. We just want to thank you for the incredible sacrifice that you made and you are making for each of us every single day. So thank you so much for that. And thank you, Connect, for tuning in and checking us out and spending your morning with us. Just a reminder that if you haven't yet, like and follow our page here on Facebook or subscribe to our page here on YouTube. Whatever your preferred method of seeing us and checking us out is, just make sure that you're uh, subscribed or liking and following us because we want to stay connected with you here at Connect Church. And you know what? If you haven't yet, say hi down below. If you're this is your first time, say first down below. Just let us know you're here because we want to love you. We want to connect with you. And uh, I got I to gotta do a plug for Connect Youth because I'm the youth pastor and it's what I do. And you guys are my favorite. I love you guys. So I need more followers. I need more followers on Instagram at Connect YTH. You got to be following the Connect Youth Instagram page because if you don't, you're going to be missing out on a whole lot of stuff we got going on. Besides our daily devotionals, every night this week, we're going to be doing an Instagram live Q&A with me where I try to tackle all of the questions you throw at me. Nothing is off limits. You can ask me anything. I'm going to try to answer it as best as I can. So bear with me there. But at the end of this week, we're going to be doing a Zoom meeting and you will miss out on that hangout if you're not following us on Instagram. So make sure that you're tuned in to what we got going on at Connect Youth. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue with worship through our tithes and our offerings. And you can always give by just texting the word give to 84321. You can always go to connectchurchaz.org slash give. Um, so I encourage you to take this time now to do so. And uh, will you pray with me? Father God, thank you. Thank you for Connect Church and the love that we get to pour out on others. But thank you for the way that we are loved by those who give their lives so that we can be safe. Thank you for the way that we are loved by those who are our family, our friends, that are our community, that are outside of us, that risk everything so that they can protect the people they love. We thank you for them and we ask that you keep them safe that you keep them close to your heart. And as we honor them and we honor you, we pray that we can continue to honor you through this offering that you bless, that we can continue to love on others as we feel loved ourselves. And that, Father, as you continue to love us, you encourage us to continue being loved to the world. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Connect. Good morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Most of the time, in a more typical year, about a half of you would be heading off, to, heading off to the mountain somewhere or over to San Diego or down into Rocky Point in Mexico. But instead, you're sitting in your living rooms watching me. But well, we're glad you're here. My name's David. I'm the pastor of Connect Church. Today, we're wrapping up a series we've been calling Defining Moments. Last week, we took a look at Philippians chapter 4, Lessons from a Lockdown. We're continuing the rest of that passage, part 2 of Lessons from a Lockdown, in this series called Defining Moments. So if you want to grab your message notes, if you got them from me, and again, if you don't get my notes but you would like to, the uh, email address for the church is here on the bottom of the screen. Send us an email and say, just add me to the list. And we know what that means. And you'll get our message notes. And I promise you, we won't be bugging you with other stuff like you might be concerned about. You have my word on that. 
We're going into Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 10. Here's what an author by the name of Paul says. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Now, taking the words of Paul similar to last week and looking at the lessons we can learn from a lockdown, here's what we learned from this passage, a few quick thoughts. Number one, in a lockdown, exercise concern. See, when you put others first, when you exercise care, when you share expressions of concern for them, two things happen. Number one, it blesses them. We live in a world filled with apathy and busyness. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, most people go through life feeling somewhat invisible or at the very least feeling like they don't matter. But when you show concern for them, it resonates deeply, deep within their souls. And that happens with them. It's a blessing to them. Now, here's the second thing that happens. It happens to you. What happens is it grows your heart and it keeps your heart soft. See, many people today have been hurt. And when we get hurt, we have a tendency to put up walls or we grow calloused. Or in this age of selfies, we have grown self-centered. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Neither of those is God's plan. It's not God's plan for us to be selfish, nor is it God's plan for us to put up walls or be calloused in life. And when we, when we care for others, when we share with others, when we express concern for others, it softens our heart and then it grows it. See, exercising concern for others is God's antidote for your hurt or your selfishness. An expression of care, an expression of concern benefits everyone. Now, that's the first thing that Paul's talking about here, how this church expressed care and concern for him, how it blessed him and how it helped them. Now, here's the second thing that's going on here with Paul. In a lockdown, Paul says, learn to be content. The biggest disease in the United States today is dis-ease. See, Americans aren't content. We aren't content with our lives. We're not content with our jobs. We're not content with our spouses in many cases. We're not content with our levels of income. We're not content with our cars. We're not content with our bodies. We're not content with ourselves. The great American Benjamin Franklin said these words, content makes poor man rich and discontent makes rich men poor. Now, Paul is writing this lesson about care and concern and contentment from prison. Let that sink in for just a minute. Here is Paul. He's in prison. He has been beaten. He is chained to a guard. Earlier in this letter, he said he didn't know if he was going to live or die. So those are some uh, external stressors. Would you agree? And yet sitting there in whatever this prison setting looked like, Paul was writing a letter to a church that he dearly loved on the topic of contentment. Now when Paul wrote this, Paul's original audience understood contentment to mean like being self-sufficient. But that's not what Paul's writing to them about. What Paul is actually doing is Paul was inviting his early century readers not to be self-sufficient, but how to honor and live in God's contentment. See, God doesn't need anything or anyone. God is actually self-sufficient, but God has this type of contentment in who he is. And then when God resides within me through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me, God's contentment should then guide my life and your life from the inside out. And Paul was able to be content in this prison setting because God's contentment was in him, and he understood there was a purpose even within these unfortunate circumstances. Now let's look at a parallel. In our current circumstances of the COVID-19 lockdown, when you think about ideas of satisfaction and joy within circumstances we can't change or control, what would that look like? Now here's what's interesting. 
the circumstances here with COVID-19 allow opportunities for you and I to exercise care and concern and to find contentment within ourselves that we would not have ordinarily have experienced. See, Tammy and I have met neighbors and we have exercised care to people in our own neighborhood that we would never have otherwise really engaged had the circumstances of this pandemic not allowed our paths to cross, not put us in proximity together, even though we live in the same neighborhood. And there is an internal joy, an internal satisfaction that comes when you share in the caring process. Now, here's something I want you to pick out of this passage. You're going to see it here, and you're going to see it again later. There is a progression of thought that is threaded throughout this. See, Paul was teaching us that when we exercise care, one thing leads to another. So in this process, in this progression of thought, caring for others is one piece of a formula in finding contentment to yourself. Now, I want you to understand, contentment does not come naturally to humanity. It doesn't come naturally to me, and I'm going to guess it doesn't come naturally to you. That's why twice in these few verses, verses 11 and 12, Paul talks about how he had to learn to be content. He uses that phrase twice. In verse 11, he says, I learned to be content. In verse 12, he says, I have learned the secret of being content. What's Paul doing here? Paul is being transparent. He's acknowledging that earlier in his life, he didn't get this right. Earlier in his life, Paul was actually a man of uh, great means, probably a little bit on the rich side of life. He had a lot of power, control. People looked up to him. Paul says, but I didn't get the contentment thing right. I had to learn how to do it because it didn't come natural to me. And part of spiritual maturity and part of spiritual growth is learning how to find contentment. Have you ever had to repeat something? Maybe you had to repeat a class in college that you didn't do well in, or maybe somewhere in your uh, early education process you had to repeat a grade. It's because we don't fully understand something. We, we didn't get it right. And that's what Paul's saying here. Now, apply that, this lesson about contentment, to whatever the issue or struggle is going on in your marriage, whatever your frustration going on in your career, whatever your feelings about your personal body image, whatever's going on in your finances, whatever's going on in your emotions right now in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, what does learning the secret of being content look like for you? It's not one size fits all. But there are things that happen in our relationship with Christ where he teaches us from the inside out in our maturing and growth process the secret of finding contentment. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that you should never look to better yourself, that you should never look to grow in your career or in your financial capacity. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that what we have to do from the personal, the maturity, the spiritual perspective is to allow the God within us to make the most of whatever moment or season we find ourselves in. A friend of mine put it this way. You can choose to be a thermostat or you can choose to be a thermometer. See, when you're a thermometer, you're always measuring the ups and downs. You're always measuring whether something's hot or something's cold. And the, the thermometer settings will go up and down depending on the temperature, depending on the environment. It just adapts like a chameleon, so to speak. Well, in the same kind of way, when you're reading the circumstances that are involved in your life, or some of you may even feel like circumstances that are attacking your life, you have a tendency, if you're a thermometer, to respond. When things are going well, you respond well. When things are going poorly, you respond poorly. You kind of live this yo-yo life, this thermometer life of ups and downs. Or, as Paul is trying to teach us here, the simple analogy is, don't be a thermometer that fluctuates with the ups and downs of the temperature or the season in your life. Choose to be a thermostat. See, a thermostat is connected to something and has a consistency and a constancy about it. And Paul would say, be connected to Christ. When you're connected to Christ, when things are up and things are down, the contentment in your life is steady. It's consistent. You remain steady and constant regardless of the circumstances going on 
around you. That's why in verse number 13, Paul said, I can do all things not because I'm good looking, not because I'm a superior athlete, not because I'm smarter than anybody else, not because I'm wealthier, not because I've got better physical attributes or I drive a fancier car. Paul didn't say that. Paul said, I can do all things, how? Through Christ who gives me strength. Now, a lot of people want to take that passage and they want to apply it to all these different things in their lives that allows them to have some kind of a self-righteous, superior attitude. That's not what Paul's saying here. In this context, Paul was talking specifically about when you're going through times of struggle, you're going through times of suffering, when the circumstances around you are greater than your ability to cope with them, in the midst of those circumstances, you can find strength through Him. See, the key to contentment it's not found in a place. And right now, you know, we got nothing else to do. We would all might as well just be in Maui, right? Laying on the beach. They're not found there. The key to contentment is not found in a philosophy. It's not like, well, if I can just think deeper thoughts, and if I can just have a, a deeper life, if I can have a, a deeper intellect, that's not found there. The key to contentment is found in a person. It's found in the personhood of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the question. What if? What if you could emerge from COVID-19 having learned how to have a deep contentment in your life and you would have not otherwise found? Now, Paul continues this passage. And at this point, Paul's going to start narrowing the funnel in his progression of thoughts. And in verse number 14, here's what Paul says. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Underline that phrase in your Bible or highlight it on your flat screen or if you print it off the message notes, somehow mark that passage, key passage to all of this issue with contentment. Verse 18, I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. So in the first, pa first part of this passage, beginning at verse number 10 and going towards the end of this chapter, Paul teaches us that in a lockdown that we want to exercise concern. And Paul teaches us that in a lockdown we want to learn to be content. Now, here's where Paul really brings home this idea, this understanding of life in and with Christ. In a lockdown, grow your account. I am aware that as I am sharing this conversation with you, that 23.1 million Americans are currently unemployed. That 14.7% 14.7% of the American workforce is currently unemployed. A little context, two months ago, 60 days ago, 3.5% of the American workforce was unemployed. Are you beginning to grasp the magnitude? Let me give you a little bit more context if that doesn't help. Back during the Great Depression, the average unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 14%. During the great pandemic, it's currently sitting at 14.7%. And it would make perfect sense to me if you could talk back through this camera into my ear. If you were to be saying something like, but David, how in the world can I be content when I'm not sure I can even provide for my family next week? It's a fair question, and one I take very seriously. That's why I'm going to walk you through what Paul says about crediting your account, growing your account 
through your contentment. First, here's what I want you to understand. I don't take it lightly. It's tough. There's no doubt about it. Most of us, at one point in our lives, either have or we will experience something very similar to what you're experiencing right now. Secondly, your situation is absolutely real. But here's what I want you to appreciate. You have a real need, but your real need has not caught God off guard. It's not like God was going, oh, I didn't think about them. They got a, they got a mortgage due and a, house, and a car payment due in a couple of weeks. See, God gave us this scripture to prepare us for and to coach us through times like the ones we're in right now. Which leads me to my third thought. My third thought is this. As you experience this lockdown, there is no better time for you to learn what the Bible has to say about personal finances than right now. Now, hear me. This is not a message. This is not a conversation about money. Having said that, as your pastor, I would be dishonoring Scripture and I would be doing you an incredible disservice if I didn't take a moment and delve into the realities of what Paul was teaching here about the lessons you and I can learn during the current struggles in our life that God wants to share his counsel with through his word from a man who was sitting in prison after he'd been beaten, not knowing if he's going to live and die, and he's chained to a guard. So here's what God has to say about this, and it's real important. In fact, if you grasp this, it will absolutely be a defining moment, not just today, but this is a defining moment that will define the rest of your life, in the good times and in the bad times, when the skies are bright and when things feel dark. So here we go. See, because this passage is all about the power of trusting. Someone once said, generosity is what keeps the things we own from owning us. Folks, that's liberating. Even Bob Iger, who just recently retired uh, after 15 years of being the CEO of Disney, said these words, anything that reminds you that you are not the center of the universe is a good thing. And so this is kind of, kind of mind-blowing, right? I mean, Many of you right now have been knocked off kilter. You're no longer king of your own universe. And one of the lessons that you can learn in this lockdown is how to be spiritually recalibrated, how to find yourself living in full alignment with God. See, in verse number 17, which I pointed out a few minutes ago, Paul says, what you have given has been credited to your account. Generosity is not God's way of raising money because the fact of the matter is God doesn't need money. Generosity is not God's way of raising money. Generosity is God's way of raising up people. See, Paul uses a bookkeeping metaphor here to teach you and me a people listen lesson. He talks about an accounting principle. N.T. Wright is a very popular author and Bible commentator. N.T. Wright says these words. He says, what's actually happened through the Philippians giving to Paul is that their own account in God's eyes has received a healthy credit. Now here's what's mind-blowing to me. Who knew God was an accountant? I mean, there are all kinds of names for God in the Bible. We think, we call him the Lion of Judah. We say he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end. We say that he is El Shaddai, the God of the mountain. We say that he's Elohim, he's the Supreme One, the Powerful One, the Creator. We say that he is Abba, and we call him Father. And here we learn that God's also an accountant, that God keeps an account of how generous you are. God notices when you give in generosity and that goes in as a credit in your account with him to which Paul says generosity generates an aroma and a fragrance that is acceptable and pleasing to God. 
Have you ever been drawn to the appeal of a pleasant aroma? Tammy and I have this thing. Uh, frequently when we're walking our dogs, especially right around dusk, we'll be walking around our neighborhood, and all of a sudden, Tammy will look at me and she'll go, that house. Now, I know exactly what she means. Because I'm walking the two slower dogs, it takes me a minute to get to where she is. But I get there, and it's like, oh, somebody is grilling something nice out in their backyard. It might be burgers or steaks or chickens, but we're going to be their new best friends. Because it just catches your attention. We just like want to stand there in a minute. Our dogs are sniffing in the air. But it is something that is pleasing, something that catches our attention. For some of you, it might not be that. It might be when you wake up on Thanksgiving morning and your mother or your grandmother or your spouse has already started baking the pies. And you go walking out and you go, ugh. You just kind of melt. You can't, you're going to pull them out of the oven and get started early. For some of you teenagers who are watching, you know the smell of pizza, don't you? It's the way it works. I was walking through the grocery store the other day, and as I came into the produce section, there were the lady over here in one section, and there was a man over here in another section, and they were doing the exact same thing with different pieces of fruit. You know what it is? Yep. She had like a cantaloupe and was sniffing it, trying to find this. Was it, did it smell sweet? Did it smell ripe? He was doing the same thing with a watermelon, smelling it, trying to see, was this the one they wanted to buy? Was this the one that was going to, you know, just attack their palate and all of their taste sensories? And it was just going to be this incredible experience. Men, you may not be the guy who sniffs the watermelon, but I bet under the right circumstances, you can be attracted to the memory of your wife's perfume. Maybe it was the kind of perfume she wore on the first date. Maybe it's what she was wearing uh, when you proposed to her or on her wedding day. Sometimes she'll still wear it, and when she does, that fragrance is incredible to you, and your mind is flooded with memories and imagery of something very special, something very appealing, something very attractive to you. That's what fragrance does. The other side of this coin is we can be turned off by unpleasant aromas. Have you ever noticed that uh, if something is, smells good, it smells nice, that we call it a fragrance or an aroma, but if something smells unpleasant, something smells nasty, we call it an odor or a smell. And in this passage, Paul was saying that when we have acts of generosity, that God notices it, and in our generosity, it as we are serving others, as we're expressing care to others, it is like a fragrance, it's like an aroma that circles back up into heaven, into the nostrils of God, if you will. Now, this is all done here in Philippians 4.18. Let me read this passage to you from two different versions of the Bible. Typically, I'm reading from the NIV in my main section. But in the message version of the Bible, verse 18, here's how it's recorded. And now I have it all. And keep getting more. The gifts you sent with Epaphroditus were more than enough. Like a sweet-smelling sacrifice, roasting on the altar, filling the air with fragrance, pleasing God to no end. Another translation says it like this. Now I have everything I want. In fact, I'm rich. Yes, I am quite content thanks to your gifts received through Epaphroditus. Your generosity is like a lovely fragrance, a sacrifice that pleases the very heart of God. See, the generosity factor in my finances and yours is either a stench or a scent to God. It either reeks of the stench of selfishness or it has this phenomenal scent of self-sacrifice. And do not skip over 
that word here, sacrifice, generosity, whether you are a person of great means or you're a person who's personally struggling, generosity always involves personal sacrifice. Now, before you go off and think that I have lost touch with reality, and you're sitting there thinking, now, David, get real. I don't know how I'm going to make my car payment in just a couple of weeks. Even if I wanted to be generous, I can't. Do you remember a few minutes ago when I was explaining the progression of this passage and I explained to you how expressions of care led to a spirit of contentment? Well, this is the next step in the progression of Paul's thinking in this passage. This is another progression which leads us to the understanding, and we can't discount this, folks, of what it means to actually do and share and live life with God. See, even in poor circumstances, verse, th verse 13 is a promise. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so it would look like this. When you and I look at a situation and we make the choice to exercise care, as we're doing that and we're blessing the other person, our hearts are softening. And as our hearts soften, they're also growing. And they're growing, they're expanding because God continues to fill them with himself. And so we do the exercises of care, grows our heart, which leads to a sense of personal contentment. And then in that state of personal contentment, we understand that life is not all about us, and we choose to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And so care leads to contentment, which then produces a life of generosity, and God expands our account according to himself. And Connect, I have bragged about you for weeks. You are a generous people. Those of you who were with us before the pandemic and were a part of this physical body, and those of you who have joined us over the past few months, and you are a part of our online congregation, you're even getting involved these days and being generous. But Connect, you are incredibly generous. I'm thinking back to last Saturday, to that graduation event, and I'm thinking about the kids whose lives were blessed, the families who were touched. I'm still getting emails from families going, my kid been opening cards and going back and looking through. I can't believe your church gave this, my son, my daughter, my grandchild. You don't even know them and you gave them all these things. You guys are amazing and you get this. But here's what I want you to understand, Connect. Last Saturday when we did that, just through the natural expression of who we are in Christ, understanding Paul's metaphor here, can you imagine how sweet heaven smelled last Saturday morning because of your generosity? Now, the rest of you, you're still looking at me going, okay, David, you kind of strung me along. How? How do I do this? That's what I want you to understand. You have an account with God. You've begun to generate a pregnant fragrance, but you're still stuck in circumstances beyond your control. God says, not David, God says, because of your faithfulness, which I have credited to your account, I'm going to take the pressure off of you. And the re resolution to all of the how is found in verse number 19. It says, and God will meet all of your needs according to the riches found in Wells Fargo Bank. God will meet all of your needs according to the riches found in the Bank of America. God will meet all your needs according to the riches found in the treasury of the United States. As wonderful as those treasuries might be, that's not how God's going to meet your need. God says, I'll meet your needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus. See, folks, this isn't a financial issue. It is a spiritual issue. It's not a human issue. It is a supernatural God issue. See, we talked about those names for Christ. Alpha, Omega, Beginning, In, El Shaddai, Elohim, Abba, Accountant. But there's one more name for him here. In the Old Testament, he was called 
Yahweh Yira, which literally means I will provide. God says, I'm going to provide through you according to the riches in Christ Jesus, and some of it will make no sense to you, but because of your generosity and the account that I've been keeping on your behalf, we got this. Now, folks, right here, right now, at the close of this series, this is a defining moment in your life for you to learn in this lockdown. Your true contentment is born out of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And as the Apostle Paul says, and I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Would you pray with me? Father, some of the folks who are sharing in this conversation here this morning are tired and scared, and they don't feel like they have a lot of strength emotionally, financially, mentally, physically. Holy Spirit, I would ask that these words written by the Apostle Paul from a prison thousands of years ago, shared through this medium here at Connect Church, by your power, would penetrate hearts and give encouragement where encouragement is needed, hope where hope is needed, a new understanding where understanding is needed, and God, a draw on your supernatural abundance where those things are needed. And for some of you, this sounds well and good, but you haven't yet taken that step where you've asked Jesus Christ into your life and you've begun a personal relationship with Him, which then in a process opens up all of these promises to you. And you want to make that decision today. Would you pray with me in the privacy of your mind? Just repeat these words. Lord Jesus, come into my life right now. Forgive me of my sin. Become my forgiver. My friend, my leader, my Lord, Jesus, from this day forward, my life is yours. And folks, if you prayed that prayer, if you're watching on Facebook Live or something, would you just in the comment section write, I said yes to Jesus? Or if you want to send us an email to that email address that was on the screen earlier, do that and let us know. We absolutely want to celebrate the abundance that you've just stepped into. And now, Father, we thank you for all of your goodness. We worship you and honor you with every fabric in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
thanks, James. Hey, do you guys appreciate James on the worship team? There in your comments, do the little applause thing or the thumbs up or just say thanks, James, or something like that. Folks, we are glad that you are joining us this morning. We hope you've had an incredible experience. Next Sunday, we have a real treat for you. My good friend, Ivan Pitts, pastor of the Second Baptist Church in Santa Ana, California, is going to be our guest speaker. I'll be here to kind of emcee the service a little bit, uh, and Ivan's going to, sh- he's an incredible communicator. I had the privilege of sharing at his church a little over a year ago. Phenomenal people. Uh, join us Wednesday night when uh, his worship pastor, uh, Dwayne Roberts, will be leading the music part of our worship and prayer gathering Wednesday night at 6.30 through Facebook Live. We're glad you're a part of this experience today. Hope it was a good one for you. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks so much.